Hey, good afternoon and welcome to Praxis Peace Institute's Planetary Pause series. I'm Georgia Kelly, the director of Praxis, and today we are honored to host longtime peace activist and friend of Praxis, Norman Solomon. Norman is an American journalist, media critic, author, and national director of the highly active and effective Roots Action, a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to galvanizing people who are committed to economic fairness, equal rights for all, civil liberties, environmental protection, and defunding endless wars, which we will talk about today. He is the author of a dozen books, including Made Love Got War, Close Encounters with America's Warfare State, and War Made Easy, How Presidents and Pundits Keep Spinning Us to Death, literally, which was made into a film narrated by Sean Penn. But today we are talking about his recently published book, which I highly recommend you all run out and buy. And this is what it looks like. War Made Invisible. We have it at Reader's Books at our local bookstore in Sonoma. Uh, I learned many new things about the US military, the media role in war, and kind of the disgusting amount of money being made in the war economy, while people are suffering everywhere because of our military interventions. So this is a book I highly recommend in order to understand our country, which is kind of thriving for an oligarchic class in the war economy. So welcome, Norman. Thanks very much, Georgia. And as you say, thriving. Uh, at a time of oligarchy for a few and many suffering. I yeah. hope you can all hear me adequately. Can you nod if you can? Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. it's, a, it's a little echoey, but I, so just if you speak slowly, I think we'll have no trouble. Oh, okay. And I um, to, I to speak reasonably slowly. Uh, well, well, first, thanks to everybody for convening here. And as Georgia said, uh, my book, War Made Invisible, has come out just in the last few weeks, and it's something that is uh, my first book in 15 years, and a previous one was called War Made Easy, and initially when I thought to try to write about and understand what's happened since about 2005, I thought, well, I'll just consider this a sequel war made easy, more war made easy, something like that. And I realized pretty soon that what's involved in our trajectory during what's been called the war on terror has been an evolution. There are a lot of characteristics that are still the same, but there has been a gradual transformation. When you think about the invasions of Afghanistan, and Iraq, there were hundreds of thousands of US troops involved, the cliche being troops on the ground. But gradually, as the United States pulled troops out of Iraq and then Afghanistan, there's been more and more reliance on air power, drone strikes, essentially being above it all, literally and figuratively. And so while, as I chronicle in the book, there was never adequate coverage even of the real suffering from U.S. troops and their loved ones, let alone what happened when the missiles landed. As time went on, there's been less and less media and political focus on the actual effects of U.S. warfare. And I think it's notable that, for instance, a year or so ago, when a new budget was proposed by President Biden, Reuters News Service reported that it was the highest budget, and I'm quoting here, in peacetime. So the assumption is that we are in peacetime. And it goes to the invisibility of the warfare state. It's become more and more ubiquitous. It's become less and less noticeable. It blended into the woodwork. It has become a kind of a uh, dog bites human story in terms of news media. We rarely hear about what the United States military is actually doing. Occasionally, there are some reports of the US launches uh, airstrikes in Syria or in Somalia 
maybe mention that there are 1,000 US troops right now in Syria, for instance, but it's pretty much off of the media and political radar screen. And that's facilitated by the fact that uh, US troops are not really on the ground very much, which goes to one of the major themes uh, that I tried to really explore and delve into in the book, which is that when you get down to it, the discourse of politics on Capitol Hill and in U US media, it's about us. These wars are about us. The US media coverage of military involvement in Afghanistan basically was only uh, of a high quantity during three periods in 20 years. There was the initial invasion. There was when President Obama sent in uh, some troops, the so-called surge around 2009, 2010, and then when the troops withdrew. And so there was a tremendous amount of violence being inflicted on people on the ground due to the US war. And yet very little of that was reflected. For instance, 70% of the population in Afghanistan is rural. The most uh, tremendous violence was uh, inflicted in Southern Afghanistan, in Helmand province. Uh, Anand Gopal, one of the few US journalists to spend much time in rural areas uh, said in, in an interview on Democracy Now!, right when the final withdrawal of US troops was taking place, that the amount of killing and wounding from the US airstrikes uh, in Helmand province was tremendously underreported and undercounted. And it goes to the point who counts, who does the counting, and who goes uncounted. And I think the book makes a case that really US foreign policy, the media atmosphere, and the political discourse such as it is, has divided people into two categories on this planet, people who count and people who don't. And in terms of US military activities in those wars, there are two tiers of grief. People whose grief matters tremendously, and people whose grief does not really matter. And as it happens, and this is a reality, the second category, the tier of grief of people that doesn't matter are those who are at the end of US firepower. What are we talking about here? Well, the Brown University costs of living program, the costs of, of war program, uh, living and dying, you might say, uh, has really done a conservative and concerted effort at Brown U to estimate as closely as possible the human toll of the so-called war on terror over the past 21, 22 years or so. And they found um, close to 400,000 civilians have been directly, and I emphasize directly killed, the total death toll, direct kills, very close to 1 million, about 950,000 at last count. For each of those people, and this especially refers to civilians, for each one of those directly killed, several times as many indirectly killed through disruption and destruction of infrastructure, sanitation, potable water, agriculture, the entire gamut of what keeps people alive. And so what happened on 9-11 with the horrible deaths of 3,000 people became a political license to kill. And that's what proceeded. It was preemptive absolution. When Donald Rumsfeld said shortly after the US invasion of Afghanistan, that every single death in Afghanistan, whether due to Taliban or US military activity, was the fault of the Taliban because of what happened on 
he was issuing preemptive absolution for anything that would occur in the following years, and as it turned out, decades, where civilians would be killed by US firepower. And one of the things I go into in the book is this idea of, yeah, but Americans, American forces and the commanders of the US military, they don't intentionally go out and kill civilians. So why blame them? They're, these are errors, these are mistakes. And they are not intentional, but they're predictable. And I would give an example. Let's say in uh, Santa Rosa, the police force makes a practice whenever there's somebody who commits a crime, then anybody in the neighborhood uh, might be behind uh, store plate glass windows, might be in their homes. And to search for those uh, criminals, the police would spray the shopping district with uh, shrapnel, uh, with machine gun fire, maybe drop bombs once in a while. And when people who were innocent bystanders were, bystanders were killed, the response from authorities could always be, oh, well, you know, that was, that was a mistake. Uh, that's unintentional. When I met a seven-year-old girl in Kabul in 2009, who had been woken up one morning by US bombs that fell in her neighborhood. At that point, she was seven years old and she had one arm. There was no compensation of any sort, not that you could really compensate for uh, taking an arm away from a little girl, but no compensation even offered. I saw her in a refugee camp. Uh, we have the money to kill. We don't have the money to prevent the killing. And this is actually quite relevant. Uh, we might want to get into this. The decision made in the last week to send cluster munitions, which I write about in the book in terms of usage, uh, one of the most horrific weapons ever devised for uh, warfare, and now to ship them to Ukraine. They've just been arriving in the last couple of days. I think I'll pause there and just uh, really, as always, really welcome uh, questions. Yeah, I've got tons of questions, some of which you have answered uh, already, but I've got about 11 of them. So I'll just go through the ones that I think we really want to touch on today. You, you've um, given us kind of an overview, too. Um, but the war economy, which is part of the whole U.S. economy, I think we are living in a war economy, and the state of permanent war, which is too rarely talked about in the media at all. Um, so I want you to comment on the mainstream media uh, rarely connects the dots for our continual wars. And um, you bring years of research, political activism, knowledge to the conundrum of why we are at war somewhere all the time. And I think it's important that we learn to look at the whole picture. Uh, and, and in a way, it's a discipline, not only to the uh, media stories were served up on a daily basis. I would like you to give us uh, one or two examples of the U.S. bias in our mainstream media, maybe um, looking at the coverage of the Russia-Ukraine war, for instance. Um, how is the media shaping this in a way that's causing this tremendous split in the progressive movement about that war? Can you get, talk a little bit about that the way the media is shaping people's thinking, even progressives. Yeah, the, the thinking is shaped very much by often an implicit assumption that the United States has a prog prerogative to make the rules and break the rules. And so that the United States is assumed, presumed, or we're persuaded to believe is uh, the more the, the moral actor and that for instance when the united states invades a country that well it's sort of a mistake it's a departure from our character but when russia invades a country then it's a testimony to their evil and their interest in domination of europe or who knows uh, that's uh, sort of what's implied and the the result is that our window on the world is tinted red, white, and blue, and that's how we see it. Uh, we're 5% of the world's population here, but the vantage point is presumptive. So to take a specific example, uh, when Anthony Blinken or President Biden have said that 
it is absolutely unacceptable for the world order for one nation to invade another. These are people who avidly supported themselves and helped aid and abet the invasion of Iraq. Well, the response we might make is, well, that was then, this is now, we're trying to have good standards. But uh, a big problem is when we keep moving the goalposts and we say as a country, do as we say, not as we do, uh, that's highly problematic, to put it mildly. Then there's the question of how the suffering from the wars is portrayed. And in the book I document, there has been, and I think appropriately, if you set aside the political coverage, the political spin, excellent US media coverage of the suffering from the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. And that's appropriate, that's what we need. Uh, but I show that we've had the kind of reporting and headlines about the suffering from the Russian invasion of Ukraine that we virtually never got from the mass media when the US invaded Afghanistan and Iraq. And so that undermines our capacity to even come to the world or see the world in a way that acknowledges that other people have their other vantage points. We're devaluing the lives of some and elevating or validating appropriately the lives of others. Uh, one other aspect, which I think is very important, there is a, there's an assumption, sometimes explicit, that while the United States has absolute right to its national security concerns, any such concerns expressed by the Russian government or the Chinese government, that's just bogus. That's just should be discounted. And so when the United States, after breaking the pledge at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, went ahead and led NATO to expand up to Russia's borders, absolutely contradicting the promise from the first President Bush's administration uh, to Gorbachev, we can only see what that means if we take away from our window on the world the tint red, white, and blue, and we Imagine what it all looks like from the Kremlin windows. And from that standpoint, let's just flip it around. Um, imagine that Canada was in an alliance with Russia and put along the U US Canadian border a bunch of defensive ABM missiles, which in the case of the US NATO missiles along the border from Poland and Romania, pointing at uh, Russia, ostensibly defensive, but I'll wrap it up here. Even Radio Free Europe has reported they can be retrofitted very quickly to be offensive weapons. And so what would the US do in terms of responding to missiles along the Canadian US border? I think we know what would happen, absolutely intolerable. This doesn't justify what Russia has done, it explains and it, it underscores the need for diplomacy. And yet we are so deluged with, for lack of a better word, propaganda in the last 18 months about Ukraine that even the word diplomacy has been stigmatized as some kind of apology for Putin. I think this shows we are in a neo-McCarthyistic era. We are in a militaristic era. And as you allude to, uh, Georgia, because so many people are justifiably upset about how Ukrainians are suffering from the Russian war on their country, often people fall into a propaganda trap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a black or white situation, which it's hard to think out of. And this is why I, I want our next discussion to be about finding pieces of propaganda in our media that we can talk about because it's an abstraction to a lot of us that we have propaganda. It's not something we identify. We don't look at the news and say, oh, this is propaganda. Um, so I think it's good to have an exercise where we actually look for it, define it, and talk about it. So we'll do that on August 11th. I want to go back to something you mentioned about Brown University's Cost of War project. I found that fascinating and didn't know anything about it. And you mentioned that the US is conducting counterterrorism activities in 85 countries. I mean, this is just overwhelming to me. Uh, and, and yet we think Russia is gonna take over the world. Uh, I'm kind of uh, 
appalled at this. And I wanted you to talk maybe a little about what are these activities that our counterterrorism um, units are doing in these countries? Who are they working for? Who are they serving? Who, what companies or corporations work with them? What, what is all this conspiracy? Because it sounds well, like that. Uh, it's very structural. I think uh, as a sort of a backdrop first to that very answering that very good question, uh, the United States has 750 military bases overseas. Uh, Russia has maybe two or three dozen. China has maybe one dozen, depending on how you count them. The United States spends more on the military than the next 10 countries combined. Most of them are allies. Um, and yet uh, we're uh, supposed to believe that uh, the United States huge military budget is sort of defensive. Um, the Brown University's uh, data really is stunning. As a matter of fact, the so-called war on terror, according to the project, is actually uh, more active in more countries now than it was 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, in Africa, for instance, not only are there drone strikes and, and military attacks in Somalia from the US government, but there are special operations in much of the continent, uh, US troops, by definition, uh, secretive, and also uh, with varying degrees of reportage, joint military exercises. The independent journalist uh, Nick Turris reported a number of years ago, this is stunning. The US military is involved in joint military exercises with almost every country's military on the continent of Africa, has trained many officers who then went on to lead coups against democratically elected governments on the continent. This is sort of typical of, of what's going on. And uh, often we just don't have the reporting, uh, both yep. because it's secret and because, because US overt troops are not on the ground. Um, and I, there's a psychological element here too. As somebody pointed out to me, South China Sea has China in its middle name. But somehow our reporting is that, well, what are those Chinese uh, vessels doing, those military vessels doing the, in the Chinese, uh, in the South China Sea? This is like a country that has had the Monroe Doctrine for 200 years is going around saying, oh, well, uh, we need to push back against China. We have this terrible uh, human rights abuser, Modi, who was greeted with the red carpet a couple, a few weeks ago at the White House. Why? Because uh, it is an anti-China uh, regime and country. So I could go on and on, but I think this fits into uh, a, a broader picture where the militarization is so uh, pervasive and accepted that we have that prerogative around the world. Yeah, that, that it's it was shocking to read about this in your book because I, I really learned a lot of new things in your book and uh, and I want to think about them, talk about them, and uh, and realize how little information most of us have to make decisions, and that's very alarming. And I want to go back to um, because a lot of people I think who are Praxis members watch MSNBC. I, I'm fortunate enough to not have a TV, so I never see it. But I do know that it has a lot of influence on people who I know. And so I'd like you to comment on why this is not liberal media, why it is, uh, it's still corporate media. And I'd just like you to say a few things about that and why, where we get our news from, how important it is to have different places to get it. And maybe you, you can suggest a few. Yeah. MSNBC, uh, whether we call it liberal media or not, uh, is, is, has been very significant. The Media Watch Group FAIR did a study, uh, which I cite in the book, of the coverage of MSNBC of the Saudi-led war on Yemen. And this goes to my point, and think about it, how many uh, Ukrainian flags have you seen displayed? How many Yemeni flags have you seen displayed? Just ask yourself that. Well, um, close to 400,000 people have died in the Saudi-led and US-supported war on Yemen in the last eight years, many of them children. It is reportedly the largest cholera epidemic in history caused by the war. And yet, when the study was done of MSNBC, 
it found almost no coverage of the suffering of people in Yemen due to this war supported by the United States government. And we might say, wow, the US government was involved. And even though the US government was so involved, there was no coverage. Or we might say, maybe that's a factor as to why there wasn't coverage, because US government involvement would raise a lot of uncomfortable questions. Why are our tax dollars? Why did Obama, Trump, and now Biden actively participate in the slaughter of these children? And what did Rachel Maddow cover when she wasn't covering Yemen? This great hero, liberal hero, Rachel Maddow, she was covering Russia. Beginning in 1917, beginning in 2017, Right after Hillary Clinton lost the election, blame Russia, 5,000 times as much coverage, 5,000% 5, as much coverage of Russia, how bad Russia was, than any mention of the suffering in Ukraine, it, uh, the suffering in Yemen, I should say. So when we look at that, you, we have our opinions, but that's, that's just factual information that their researchers provided. Now, why all that coverage, and this is, way before the Ukraine invasion. This is about the allegations of Russiagate, uh, you know, social media intrusion and so forth. You can't blame uh, uh, the closeness of Hillary Clinton to Wall Street getting six figure uh, spe speaking fees from a single speech, or perhaps rather than that, you can blame Russia. So, all these people in Yemen, not good fine point, all these people in Yemen are being slaughtered with US help. Uh, but no, MSNBC is not gonna talk about that, not gonna inform you and me about it. They're gonna talk about Russia. And I would connect this to the shipment of cluster bombs. And what I'm really getting at in part is as uncomfortable as it is, it's helpful to recognize that Obama, Trump, Biden now, Biden now, they're not pursuing a moral policy. Biden is willing to slaughter people with shrapnel because he has other agendas, just as Biden for the last two years. And I worked to get Biden elected over Trump. You know, I'm not reflexively anti Biden. But if we can discard this idea, that this president, because he has a D after his name, he's a Democrat, discard this idea that therefore there's some uh, moral through line to the policy. I think if we get rid of that illusion, we can help ourselves and each other to understand what US foreign policy is about. Yeah, I'm gonna just do one more question before I open it up to the audience. Um, but I wanted to go back on this M MSNBC because you wrote about this woman, Ashley Banfield in your book, who gave an off-air speech at Kansas State University where she talked about the invisibility of the horrors of war. And uh, she quickly became persona non grata at MSNBC where she was kind of demoted, put in the closet practically. Um, and she was severely censored for this, and it wasn't even something she did on air. So this this uh, um, necessity where their uh, reporters or anchors are forced to comply with the story that they're supposed to represent to the to the public, and that's just more of this. Um, not only propaganda, but it it completely interferes with any idea we have of freedom of speech. There, there is no freedom of speech when, when the discourse is so limited. And in the case of war coverage, the consequences include that we're encouraged uh, to internalize and be transformed by what you might call an ethical, moral, spiritual corrosion. Mm -hmm. Because if certain deaths really, really matter, but then certain others don't, then what is that doing to our sense of what humanity even is? In the case of Ashley Banfield, she's someone who was a rising star at MSNBC and then as well NBC. She covered the falling of the Twin Towers. She was dispatched to the Middle East and Afghanistan. She covered the invasion 
of Iraq. She was being touted as possible successor to Katie Couric in the top anchor's chair at NBC. And then she gave, as you refer to Georgia, a few weeks after the fall of the Saddam Hussein regime, she gave a speech at Kansas State University. And she said, there's a difference between journalism and coverage. It's coverage if you see where the missiles are launched from. But if you don't really see what happens when the missiles land, then you're not getting the full story. You're getting some sort of coverage. She said, I can guarantee you when the missiles land, it's not a bunch of dust and smoke in the air. There's a lot more that happens in, in human terms. Her career was over at NBC. Uh, top management immediately issued statements, plural, that she did not speak for the network, did not mean to defame the work of her colleagues. She would choose her words more carefully. She came back to the other Manhattan, not Manhattan, Kansas, but Manhattan, New York, was transferred to a tape closet and was not let out of her contract for eight months. This is an object lesson, just as before the invasion of Iraq, Bill Donahue's top rated show was canceled. And we know that, and I quote it in the War Made Invisible book, because leaked memos showed that NBC management was very worried that he actually allowed anti-war voices in the mix. He had pro-war voices, he had anti-war voices. Well, that was too much for the network and his, his show was axed. I, I remember when that was axed and how, how incredible that was. What I'm gonna do now is open this up to questions and I, you can unmute as I call on you and give you maybe 30 seconds because I know people, well, I know one person who wants to ask a question. Should I call on you right away, Brian? Go ahead. Norman, th thanks for being here. So you have, with Roots Action Group, said, uh, don't run Biden. Uh, Joe, don't run. But give us some names. Give us, who would you recommend then? Who would you suggest? Well, we need an open primary system. The fact is that as long as Biden is running, there are many people in Congress, Democrats, who absolutely will not run. But if he were to pull out, we would have options that we don't have right now, whether it's Ro Khanna or Senator Merkley, uh, maybe even Elizabeth Warren, many others we know would step forward. You remember in 2020, there were so many people running for the nomination. They couldn't all debate in one night because they wouldn't all fit on the stage comfortably. They had two different nights of debates. That would happen again if Biden uh, were to step aside. And we have morphed the campaign at Roots Action from don't run Joe to step aside Joe now that he's a formal candidate. But really the message is the same. So, you know, I might have certain preferences and you might have certain preferences, but there's a myth that, hey, if there's a debate, there are debates, there is a, a vigorous primary then you lose the election. That's not what happened in 2020. It was very vigorous. There were a lot of contending candidates. And fortunately, um, Trump lost. And one other question for you, Norman. As you know, the military war machine budget is going to be $886 billion. And there's over 200 Democrats in Congress. They voted for this. What can we do about the military war machine that's close to $900 billion per year? Yes, and uh, that money doesn't even include the nuclear weapons budget and so forth, which is outside of the so-called Defense Department. This is a very steep climb, as usual. And I see people on this uh, call, this discussion, who are doing grassroots, have been doing grassroots work for decades inside and outside the electoral arena. And it's a long slog. It's a very difficult thing. I do think we are too deferential to elected officials because they have a dem Democratic uh, Party affiliation. Uh, when they do good things, they say, hey, we really support you doing that. They're not doing us a favor, per se. It's not like, OK, you did good things, you did things we don't agree with, so we will embrace you and accept the things that we disagree with. I think we should organize more effectively. I think we should challenge people in office. Let me just digress briefly. It's not about war, but 
Um, until last year, I was a member of the state central committee, the Democratic Party. I didn't run again. And Mike McGuire, who's very powerful. You all know Mike McGuire. He was a majority leader in the Senate. He voted for one billion with a B dollars to keep the nuclear plant uh, going in San Luis Obispo, the Diablo plant on an earthquake fault. So we finally got a meeting with him, us delegates. And the question is, hey, Mike, you've done some good things. You did this. Should we just say, oh, well, well fine, you're a nice guy. No, we should uh, be challenging publicly these kind of decisions. The same thing goes on in terms of the military budget and a, a token vote against the budget, that's good. But the language, the messaging is way more muted from Democrats when a Democrat is in the White House. And that's, that's very dangerous. And if you're as old as I am, you can remember that during the escalation of the Vietnam War, that was crucial. You had Democrats in 64, 5, 6, 67, 68. They deferred to Lyndon Johnson because they were Democrats and he was a Democrat. And we saw the results. Thank you. Uh, ben, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Um, first of all, we talked, Norman mentioned this uh, shipment of cluster bombs that was sent over. And the best uh, analysis I've heard of that is that this was like, it's like an overstock program. <laughs> The Pentagon is offloading all this uh, backstock shelf. The cluster bombs, because of the, we have a big supply, but unfortunately, uh, market conditions, i.e. international opinion, doesn't favor our using them. So we're offloading them on the Ukrainians. <laughs> so, uh, but that's just a, a sidebar. The main thing I wanted to talk to was your analysis of MSNBC. And for the life of me, I can't I, I cannot figure out why liberals put up with such thin gruel and call it this is our liberal media. I mean, at least the right gives you straight up red meat 24-7. We're served, there's like three so quasi-liberal hosts in the evening. So all the liberals feel like, ah, oh, boy, we have a network on our side. Most of the people coming into MSNBC are uh, former uh, Bush era staffers like Nicole Wallace or all of these never Trump or bulwark characters. Why am I listening to Charlie Sykes? Charlie Sykes was the Rush Limbaugh of Wisconsin until he turned, until Trump kicked him out of the party. So anyway, I just hope people understand MSNBC is not your friend. It is a disinformation channel. In some ways, I wish liberals would just demand, hey, we want liberal people 24-7 here. Why can't we have our own channel? And so we get a little taste of it. So I'm, I'm very unhappy with uh, uh, our uh, capacity to absorb punishment from them. I'd like to see people ask for more. So that's my rant on that. Uh, oh, thank you. I mean, on foreign policy, I would put um, NPR News in the same category, all things considered in morning edition. Domestic coverage, um, there's a lot of good journalism. When it gets beyond the water's edge and US foreign policy, there's a tremendous amount of uh, serving as a uh, amplifier of official US worldviews. It's very rare to get an analysis of US foreign policy that challenges not just the tactical advantages or mistakes, but the really fundamentals, it would almost be fair to say it's a mouthpiece for the US government in terms of outlook. Uh, I think it was Jake Sullivan yesterday on. These are not tough questions in general given to them, except you know, tactical matters. It's never been worse than it's been in the last year and a half in terms of the Ukraine war. You might as well be uh, listening to the equivalent of uh, Pravda or something. This is where we are. This is where we are right now. And the hypocrisy of the US in no way justifies this horrible war by Russia. But at the same time, the horrible war by Russia does not justify US hypocrisy and its own involvement in the slaughter that has been taking place at the same time in Yemen. So we're, 
really uh, we're being scammed psychologically. It's a, like what Orwell called a uh, double think. And you know, a fact put on the shelf, when convenient, taken off. And so just in terms of MSNBC, it's a corporate entity. And look at what's happened in CNN. Even CNN has been moving from slightly liberal to centrist, having a lot of right wingers on. The point of these networks from the management standpoint is to make money and to be copacetic with advertisers and the corporate system. And they all work in cahoots. That's, you know, that's the other thing, the, the combination of the revolving door with the congressional and senate senators that go back into lobbying or they come from lobbying into, the, into uh, the legislature or vice versa, and they can keep this whole thing going. It's, it's, um, it's well, like yeah, how that's a great point. I like that. I think that phrase is very important. Keep this thing going because this war with Ukraine, it is fabulously lucrative. Mm -hmm. The contractors, I'm not going to call them lowercase d defense contractors. They are military contractors. They are, this is a dream and there's no end in sight. And it goes to this uh, point from a few minutes ago. They're churning out weaponry as fast as they can. And they're not able to really keep up with the demand. Zelensky is sort of mad about it. And so that's where, as you were saying, I think, Ben, there's all these cluster munitions on the shelf. And the attitude is, hey, we've got all these cluster munitions. Why let them go to waste? We have an abundance of them. Let's just go on and send them and, and shredding people uh, with them as a result. That's that's not a big deal. I mean, that's part of the Orwellianism I talk about in the book. When Russia invaded, uh, the White House and U.S. media said they're using cluster munitions. That's a war crime. And now what the U.S. was saying was a war crime is just fine. Go ahead. We're going to be part of it. Yeah, this is this double think, as, as you point out. I mean, I have decided, I guess, many years ago that every, at least every decade, I have to reread re 1984 because we're, we're closer and closer to it every time I read it. It seemed like a fantasy the first time. It, it's no longer a fantasy. So yeah, we, I don't know what the, the answers are to that. I think, you know, when we see all the money from Citizens United going into these campaigns, we don't really have a democracy at all anymore. And I think it's, we need to stop calling it that. It's an oligarchy. And I, I'd like to just get your take on that before we wrap up today. It is an oligarchy. One of the few politicians to call it as such has been Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we hear about in the news media, Russian oligarchs. How often do news media talk about U.S. oligarchs per se. And the pressure to conform around foreign policy is so huge that you know, Bernie's basically with the program. Mm -hmm. And it's really going to be an uphill battle to raise questions about why here in the summer of 2023, diplomacy is a dirty word. As long as diplomacy is a dirty word, then we are in a, a permanent escalation process. And what we rarely hear in news media is, what is the foreseeable endpoint? Okay, we can cheerlead the Ukrainians and send them all the weapons that we can. We can feel moral about it, but where do we see all this plausibly leading? And really where it plausibly leads in this proxy war between the two nuclear superpowers with the US saying we're not going to do X, Y, Z, but then crossing its own red lines, which has happened again and again in terms of weapons shipments, it's nuclear holocaust. And as Dan Ellsberg has pointed out, the best science is that with nuclear winter resulting from a nuclear war, 99% of the humans on the planet would die in way less than a year because of extinction of agriculture. So really what's at stake here? Yeah, people don't think that far ahead. I'm going to take one last question from Brian, and that will wrap us up. So, Norman, one question. One, one thing that I like that Trump did on an international basis, he wanted to take the troops out of Somalia. He wanted to take the troops out of Syria. He wanted to reduce the troop presence in Germany from 36,000 to 24,000. When he put up the order to re 
bring the troops out of Somalia, the Pentagon just moved the troops over to one country, to Kenya. So from an international standpoint, I thought Trump did some, something good. What are your thoughts there? Uh, on that note, Trump was in the category of the broken clock that's correct once in a while. However, despite all of his reasonable at times rhetoric about Russia, he actually was doing terrible things to escalate conflicts with Russia. He killed the INF Treaty. And you may remember the, Internet, the uh, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty was a huge victory of the peace movement in the 1980s uh, from New York, from the United States to Greenham Common in England to Germany. Uh, the West had an upsurge of uh, peace activism to prevent these intermediate range missiles from being in Europe in both directions. And so Reagan was dragged kicking and screaming uh, to sign that treaty with Gorbachev and Trump killed it. Mm -hmm. And Biden hasn't done anything to resuscitate the treaty that Trump killed. And so despite all the differences of opinion style and domestically in substance, there's a real continuity and unity between the two parties in foreign policy. And I, I think I would I just add, I think it's an important point. When you look at the Republicans and Democrats in Congress on a whole huge range of domestic issues, there's an enormous difference. One is a neoliberal party. The other is a neo-fascist party. That's a really humongous difference. When you get to foreign policy and militarism, it's really hard to see the difference. And Thank it's you. been I that agree. way a long time. Yeah. It's been that way for a long time. Yeah. I'm going to, again, recommend Dorman's new book, War Made Invisible. There's so much more in it that we couldn't cover today, but it's an extraordinary book. And this is the kind of information I feel every progressive needs to have, needs to know and think about. And we're going to talk about this on our August 11th discussion. So get ready to identify propaganda to talk about. So Norman, I wanna thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your wisdom with us. It's really been uh, a very educational program for all well, of many us. Many thanks to you, Georgia, to Praxis and to everybody uh, on our call today. And we thank will you send Norman. you the recording tonight. Okay. okay, all good. Yeah, all good. So I'm gonna stop the recording now.